You all look amazing. Right on. Right on. Uh, we're we're going to put Bishop Thomas on the spot in a second from live from Las Vegas. I didn't think I'd ever in a ministry meeting say the words, we're going to live to Las Vegas to kick things off. Uh, I think it's hysterical that, that that California is so crazy right now that we had to go to Las Vegas for some peace and quiet. So, so <laughs> Hector, if you would take it away with an introduction to Bishop Thomas for us. Absolutely. Uh, guys, I'm super honored to introduce you Bishop Thomas. Uh, Bishop Thomas has been a priest. Uh, he was ordained in 1976. He's originally from uh, Montana, but he was ordained a priest in Seattle. Um, he became an auxiliary bishop in 1999 and then was installed in Helena, Helena Montana in 2004. Uh, and then he came out to us in Las Vegas in 2018, um, May 15th, actually. And uh, it, this guy has just an absolute passion for young people. When he came into the Diocese of Las Vegas, everybody said um, all these different things. And, and one of the very first things he, he brought up was, what's youth and young adult ministry look like? And uh, what he shared with me was he got a bunch of blank stares and he goes, well, that's going to change. I mean, but he's a wealth of knowledge. So I hope you have your pens and your papers ready. Um, and we'll just say a quick prayer over here and we'll just pass you the torch. Thanks, Thank you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Just say, Hail Mary. Hail Mary. Full of grace, grace the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Holy Mary Lord of God, Lord of God. Great, great blessing Lord. now and the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Bishop Brown. Thank you, Hector. Um, I'm going to tell you kind of a the Hail Mary reminded me of something that I do very regularly when I meet with the kids. Kind of a cheap trick, but you might want to try it. Uh, for years, when I used to be a parish priest back in Seattle and then uh, as a bishop in Montana, um, I would tell the kids that I always ask for prayers. And so anytime you drive by a McDonald's anywhere in the country and you see the golden arches, said, let the M remind you of Mary and say a prayer for Bishop Thomas and his ministry and wherever I happen to be. Well, I'll tell you what, now families in Las Vegas go, you're getting a whole dang rosary when you drive through town there. So dang the golden arches there. So you might want to try that little trick if you want some cheap prayers. I mean, that really does work. And I'm, I'm very uh, close to Our Lady and always bring my intentions to her. So I appreciate, Hector, that you would, um, you would start out our meeting uh, raising our voices to her and her, uh, her care. Um, I want to give a shout out both to Hector and to Connie when I begin my remarks. Um, uh, Hector's been with us a uh, obviously a short time, but his life is just phenomenal. He's a man who loves Jesus very deeply, loves the church, and he's a bridge builder. So I've noticed already the connective tissue that he has built between Chancery and so many of our youth and young adult ministries in the diocese. I'm very appreciative of him and also Connie, who is our wisdom figure. Uh, his uh, Hector's immediate supervisor, but a great mentor for him and a walking history book for me. I, I, anything I need to know about um, Connie has got these tendrils that go out all throughout the whole diocese. So I, I want to say for uh, on behalf of a grateful diocese, thank you, Hector. Thank you, Connie, for the remarkable work that you're already uh, uh, doing so well. Uh, Hector gave a little bit of a backgrounder. Um, the, uh, the the ministry I've done over the years. Is, has uh, uh, started in the, when I was a youngster in the Diocese of Helena, I was very uh, active in the church. I graduated Carroll College. Uh, all of the kids in my family, the five of us are all alums of Carroll. And then my family moved to Seattle when I was a, a late in my senior year in high school. And so I finished in, in uh, high school in Montana, but then eventually ordained for the Archdiocese of Seattle. I served as a priest there for 29 years, uh, 17 of those as Vicar General, and uh, I was Vicar General for three different archbishops, all of whom I have uh, uh, buried, uh, preached their funerals. In fact, just recently in February, I uh, buried Archbishop uh, Brunette. But they were tremendous mentors, and each one of them in his own way uh, was very supportive of our youth and young adults, and I learned from them. When I went to Montana, youth, young adult ministry became the number one priority for an entire diocese. And we watched, uh, I hired Doug Took, you all know Crazy Doug. Uh, he transformed our ministry there. I, brought, I assigned Father Mark Lenneman to Carroll College. Uh, he is a gold standard in young adult ministry. Uh, two things that happened under their tutelage. Number one is Doug 
set the diocese on fire with the numbers of kids who became involved in the church. And Father Mark Lenneman and over in the uh, Montana State University, uh, Father Val, so effective in the work they did on the campuses, we had to build full-size churches, both at Carroll College and at uh, MSU, because we could not accommodate the numbers of kids that were so uh, uh, involved in, in campus ministry there. Uh, we also had in Montana Legendary Lodge, which is this idyllic setting uh, where we have 900 kids a summer uh, coming to the lodge, and that also was transformational. So I bring a commitment and an energy that comes from ministry, but also for something else in my life that I'd say has helped to form and inform the work I do. I come from a huge family. And uh, I have 150 cousins that are spanning three generations. And then I have 37 nephews and nieces and grandnephews and nieces, uh, ranging in age from two newborns all the way up to young adults in their mid-30s now. And so in some ways, what I offer you today by way of reflections or remarks uh, finds its source in my work in ministry, but also this kind of inside track I have with this very wide spectrum of young adults in my own family. And the question I ask them, I do dialogue evenings on college campuses, I visit classrooms, I have an opportunity to interact with my family by telephone or Zoom or Skype very regularly. I ask the same question, what do you need from the church in order to enrich your life? What I've done today and what I want to offer you today is what I would describe as uh, seven insights that come from the, this body of young adults in ministry and in family. These are the, the uh, voices of young adults speaking to the church. And these are kind of distilled bits of wisdom that they have given me. And actually they are uh, characteristics of the ministry that I've tried to carry out in my now three dioceses because they, they're actually uh, insights that are born in the heart of young adults themselves. So what I'm offering you today uh, spans, I'd say, uh, every um, demographic. These are voices of kids from the urban and rural, from the affluent and low-income communities, and a whole wide expanse of cultural communities. Uh, and you'd, you'll, you'll find that these are uh, common voices. These are common cries of the young adults asking us as leaders to offer them these, these, these very precious gifts. So I'm gonna start with number one, and I'd say this is probably the biggest ticket item that I hear from my own family, and then also from this wide expanse of voices from all these various communities. Number one, Bishop, teach us to pray. If nothing else comes from your ministry and your leadership, except that you have introduced young people to Jesus Christ, you are already a success story. Um, the, the, what they're asking for is, is just such a, a powerful cry. Uh, their hearts are hungry, longing uh, for uh, depth and longing for meaning. It was John Paul that described the Eucharist in two Latin words. He called the Eucharist inestimabile donum, which means the church's most priceless gift. And what I offer to you is our kids are hungry. They're hungry for substantial prayer experience. And the source and some of that is in the presence of Eucharist. So teach our young people about this precious gift. Uh, they don't want to know so much about Jesus. They want to know Jesus. Find every opportunity, whether it's through Eucharistic adoration or the rosary or what I call the packed prayer. It's an acronym meaning petition, adoration, contrition, thanksgiving. Uh, every day I, I've taught kids about the packed prayer. Anyway, help, help them center their lives around Jesus. Teach them that the Father knows them by name and loves them, that he will fulfill their hearts. He'll, he'll fill their hearts with the longing that is so deep. Teach them about the Holy Spirit, which is an untapped resource. Uh, bottom line, they're calling for us to teach them to pray. So number one is the biggest ticket of all. Bishop, I, Stephen, sorry to interrupt you. I just wanted to keep all of my diocesan peers on, on task and let them know that I will conduct a test later. So if have only started okay. with number one, guys. I see some of you taking notes. Others I'm a little bit worried about. So, <laughs> all right. 
The second is, um, this is um, something that I learned most especially at Carroll College. Uh, number two, introduce youth to the mind of the church. It's St. Ignatius uh, writing in the 15th century, he, again, three Latin words, sentire cum ecclesia, think with the church. Teach them about the doctrinal and the moral and the social teachings. Help them to enter into the substantial content of the church's mind. Become aware of why the church holds certain positions on what I describe as neuralgic issues that are going to place them in conflict with the ways of the world. The kids from Carroll College, I said, I don't want a college that places high walls like a walled city and, and protects the kids. I want us as formators to teach the young people to be in dialogue with our detractors, with people that are critics of the church, and even people that are not so gentle who attack, uh, waiting in the wings almost. Help them to understand the mind of the church and be able to articulate the church's mind on all kinds of issues, and especially the unpopular teachings around human sexuality or gay marriage or transgenderism, but also substantial content issues that are a part of the heart of the church. It's sacramental mind, it's doctrinal teachings. Um, you know, you, you may or may not be aware of this, but we, we have a, a significant uh, Mormon population in, in Las Vegas. And one of the, uh, I think probably significant, meaning that 9% of the state and about 4% of the general population in Vegas proper. But one of the Mormon leaders said to me that when they send their kids out, either doorbelling or they send them out on these missions, it's not so much to convert the people that are hearing the doorbell ring, but it's rather to convert the young Mormon people to the mind of the Mormon church. Well, that's pretty, pretty sa uh, savvy on their part. And I'm just thinking to myself that uh, people, our young people learn a lot under the heat of conflict. We have to prepare them. So don't be at all, I mean, don't give the kids pablum. Give them strong, substantial uh, teaching that comes from the heart of the church and prepare them to go out into the marketplace to be in meaningful, fulsome dialogue with people that are not necessarily our friends. I also know that the, uh, the work that was done by Avery Cardinal Dulles uh, some years ago, I used to love to sit by him at the bishop's meeting. Uh, he was a, uh, a very wise critic of religious education. And he said that in my generation, meaning people that are in their 50s, 60s, and 70s, were oftentimes catechized but unevangelized. And then you fast forward to the millennials, we have oftentimes the opposite problem. We have people that are evangelized, but uncatechized, and oftentimes illiterate in the mind of the church. And Dulles's thesis, which I completely agree, we need to do both, catechize and evangelize the hearts of the young. And so just uh, note bene, that's the plank number two. Number three, uh, which I think is exciting, uh, it's a little bit right now um, thwarted by the, uh, the COVID pandemic, but how often do I hear this? Our young adult Catholics want to socialize with other young adult Catholics. I'm gonna ask a question. Are you aware of the groundbreaking work of author Jean Twenge? Uh, she is out of Southern Cal, in fact, I think University of San Diego. Uh, I heard her speak in person at one of the conferences I attended. A couple of books that, uh, uh, the one is called iGEM, uh, I gen meaning the younger kids would be like junior high, early high school. And the, the subtitle is significant. Why today's super connected kids are growing up less rebellious, more tolerant, less happy, and completely unprepared for adulthood. She is amazing. And the second uh, one is entitled Generation Me. This is on the millennials. Why today's young Americans are more confident, assertive, entitled, and more miserable than ever before. Well, I want you to read these books if you haven't because the insights and the thesis that I wanna point out to you out of Twenge's uh, research work is that one of the perils of the young adult right now is existential loneliness, that they are oftentimes virtually connected to one another, but the church has this golden opportunity to bring young adults in better times, and I'm thinking post COVID, but in better times to meet other Catholics. Uh, th this is uh, giving them a way to cross hybridize their lives of faith, to share values and vision, and possibly, and very likely, even to share their long-term futures together. 
we have that responsibility. Loneliness is deep seated, not just in the young Catholic, but also I'd say across the board with young adults and in large, uh, in no small part to uh, what Twenge describes as this existential loneliness that has been both caused and now exacerbated by the COVID, but caused by social isolation that comes from virtual living. So just make that note. Every opportunity we can to bring kids together uh, to meet and to be in dialogue, but also to celebrate and to, to party together, it's a great thing. Number four, one of the greatest teachers in the ways of the gospel are the poor. Those who live on the margins, uh, those who are economically disadvantaged, the homeless, the hungry, the desperate, the poor. In my last diocese, in the Diocese of Kona, we had as part of Doug Took's genius, we had what's called justice outreach. And we, were, we had young adults present at our mission in Guatemala, but also in the, uh, the Blackfeet Nation in Northern Montana. And they began to interact with people and they found that the, the tremendous richness that exists among communities that are economically disadvantaged, people who love Christ and for whom the church is the very heartbeat of their lives. And so I'm telling you, these are among the greatest teachers we can have. And if your programs do not have a component that brings people together to feed the hungry and to be present to the homeless and the poor, to be at food pantries and at soup kitchens, then I think you're missing a bet. You're missing out on one of the greatest instructors that the church has, I mean, obviously beginning with the very heart of the gospel. Blessed are the poor, and they are tremendous instructors. And I hope that you will uh, be able to learn from that and uh, to, to um, find ways to help the poor transform the hearts of our youth and our young adults. Number five, this is an insight that comes from the 19th century Jesuits. And that is, teach young people to lead others to Jesus. They are among our greatest evangelizers. So what did the Jesuits learn? They learned that when they did youth and young adult ministry well, and they taught their children, they brought the kids together around uh, uh, nativity uh, plays and uh, singing and doing little things that would bring parents to, to see the kids in action. But more importantly, they understood that what they were teaching the kids was being brought home to the dinner table. And the kids became agents of evangelization. And they were the ones who were teaching the parents about the ways of Christ and the church. And they were triggering very meaningful dialogue. And so what I'm suggesting to you is that have, have the kids be courageous and invite their friends who are lapsed Catholics to come to Christ. My nephew, Nicholas, was like little Jimmy Swaggart when he was in his, as uh, his, uh, soon as he got his driver's license. On Sunday night, he would drive his car around. He'd pick up all of his lapsed Catholic friends and he'd haul them to Mass. And, his, and the same thing with another one of my nephews who I just, for whom I just did the, his, his wedding in July. Um, they would pack their kids and they would get them involved in the youth and the young adults uh, uh, programs at the parishes. The next thing you know, he, they, they re-triggered or they reawakened the, the faith of young people. Kids working with kids. They can bring the gospel to places that you and I simply can't go by becoming courageous evangelizers. And so encourage young people to convert the hearts of their parents. Uh, as you know, uh, the, I, I would say 40% of those raised in the church now, according to Cara, are former Catholics. So we've got a great big, um, we've got a big task ahead of us to re-evangelize the Catholic community, but the youth are ways, powerful way, to unlock that door to others. Number six, this is a tough one. Hector and I were talking about this a little bit earlier. Uh, teach and preach the need for reconciliation, uh, to, to have kids become agents of reconciliation in their families, uh, knowing that all of us are coming from homes that are bruised and broken. His father, Ron Rollheiser, OMI, uh, wrote a book some years ago, The Holy Longing. He's got one little dinky paragraph in there that I, it just really triggered uh, some, some uh, imaginative thoughts in my, in my own um, ministry. He said, there is no such thing as a truly functional family, that every family is wounded and broken. And the truly functional family is a myth. 
It was Ozzie and Harriet going back to the TV back in the 1950s and 60s. And every person thought, boy, I wish my family was like Ozzie and Harriet where mom had dinner on the table at five o'clock and she was in a house dress and she wore pearls and everything was good and dad was home at the at five o'clock on the button and everybody was nice. Uh -uh. Every family was broken. So here's what he said. We have to redefine the meaning of the functional family. Now I'm saying functional family, functional parish, functional diocese. And this is what it is. The functional family is the family in which functions, that is compassion, love, forgiveness, helpfulness, kind, in which functions begin to outweigh dysfunctions. And teach our young people, and also do this in your own family, become agents of healing and reconciliation. And in your parish, every parish is a little bit of craziness. Archbishop Murphy, who I worked for back in Seattle, used to say the church is like the great bush in which cardinals, crows, and cuckoos roost together. Well, every parish has got its share of cuckoos. And every family, you know this in your own extended family, there are people that are a little bit on the wacko side. And you can't get pulled into that agenda. Hector and I were talking about this, this kind of mean spiritedness that we're seeing right now that's being promulgated by some of the websites and some of the crazy language that's coming from some of these, these very extreme uh, groups. Don't take the bait. Uh, become agents of healing and conciliation and teach our young people that you don't have to come from a perfect family, but what we can do, we can do really well uh, to be gospel people and to let the healing of Jesus, first of all, affect our own hearts and bring healing and hope, but also in our extended family, don't get pulled into the madness ever. In your parish, don't get pulled into the agenda that is so often present when you get extreme voices or mean-spirited people. There's no such thing as a perfect diocese, beginning with this bishop. I mean, you've got a, an imperfect bishop speaking to you, but I know that the Lord Jesus brings amazing grace into our lives. And to help the kids understand that, that they are powerful and they can bring that beautiful healing, in, first of all, into their own hearts by discovering the power of the sacrament of reconciliation, but also to let the, the healing balm of Christ uh, affect their hearts and then bring it to mom and dad. Uh, there are generational grudges and hurts in families to help them be agents of healing in that regard as well. The next thing you know, you see this kind of unbalanced teeter-totter with all this dysfunction begins to even out. And the next thing you know, the functionality begins to really outweigh all this craziness. And you'll see that. I think the responsibility of good leadership and as, as young adult leaders, you've got a great opportunity responsibility is to model healing ministry and conciliation in our families, in our direct ministry, in our parish, in our diocese. And the next thing you know, wow, beautiful things happen in powerful ways. Lastly, take every opportunity to engage the youth in the ministries of the church. Way back when, when I was uh, in my, my first, um, after I finished graduate school, I, I, I was assigned to a parish and I asked the pastor, where are all the young people? Uh, it was amazing. I mean, every mass we had beginning at Saturday night, all Sunday, there were lots of people with gray hair, but I go, there's gotta be young people in the parish. So I asked him, to, I, I really did something extreme. And, and I, this is, might be one of those, don't try this at home suggestions. But I asked the pastor, if it would be possible for us at the five o'clock mass on Saturday, to put all the uh, ministers at the altar and the lecture and the choir and the acolyte, put everybody on sabbatical and to bring in uh, depute all the young people to take over the ministries of that church at that mass. And I did something kind of sneaky. I, I sat down with two of the most uh, effective and I'd say also the most popular uh, couple young adults. We had a, a lunch together and I said, I need your help. I need your help to make a lot of phone calls and to invite the youth of our parish to become engaged in the ministries of five o'clock mass. And they did it. I mean, so fast forward a couple of months, we had so many people, so many youngsters engaged in the mass. We were making up ministries in order to engage them. For example, instead of having a procession with a banner and a cross, we had to have like this whole long procession of ribbon banners because we had to give something for these kids to do. 
we put together a folk group that turned out to be wonderful, but the kids were outstanding, well-prepared lectors. Uh, they were outstanding acolytes. And the next thing we knew, and here's the other key, mom and dad wanted to see Johnny and Susie doing their thing. That was a standing room only mass. And it went from a sleepy geriatric mass on Saturday night to this extraordinary energetic youth bound ministry. And I'd say, you know, obviously you're not the pastor in the parish, um, but you can surely ask me about ways to open up those conduits and get the kids involved. When I confirmed kids in Vegas or Montana or back in Seattle, it used to drive me crazy. When I had the confirmation liturgies and the lector is 65 years old, and we have all these young people sitting there in the front pew. They should be proclaiming the word of God. They should be all the ministers at the altar and they should be modeling good ministry for other young people. And I tell you, for those who have followed the birth of vocations, the priesthood and religious life, so often you'll hear that the vocations, the priesthood and religious life began by service at the altar and by being engaged in your ministry, by becoming assistants or associates, teaching younger people uh, as a kind of interns, uh, high school kids helping to teach grade school kids, and all the high school kids become post-confirmation, becoming very engaged. I also want to suggest this to you, that the CARA study suggests that you as the young adult ministers are among the very first to recognize vocations to ordained life and religious life. You're one of the first ones to see the initial signs of that. And I want to give you this, this challenge to be very courageous about inviting people to consider vocations to ordained life. Uh, it used to be that mom and dad were the first ones. And then as the sexual abuse crisis became heightened uh, going back 15 or so, well, back to 2002, moms and dads became concerned about, will my son become lonesome in the priesthood or will he be preyed upon? And parents kind of became really jittery about that. And oh, that's just now you need to turn around. But the CARA study shows that the pastors and those like yourselves who are engaged in the day-to-day -day ministries of the church recognize the first signs of ordained life. And I think that you should be as courageous as you can to invite young people to become very engaged lay persons in the church, uh, in the ministries that you're already doing, but also devoted married couples who love Christ and serve the church, but also ratchet uh, your courage and say, you thought about diaconate, you thought about the, the priesthood or religious uh, life as a religious woman. Um, and I think again, you'll see the invitation, uh, the, the little seeds that you plant, and you may not see immediate results, but then when somebody comes to me at age 25, and uh, I'll say, when did you first begin to think about vocation? They go, well, the youth minister back when I was 16 years old said, have you ever thought about the priesthood? And those little, those little seeds got planted in their heart, and they were germinated by time and by the, uh, the, the sweet rains of the gospel. The next thing, they sprouted. And then the young man or the young woman comes to me and says, I'd like to be considered for religious life or a priesthood. But it begins with you. And I think you have to know that uh, your words and your invitation is, are extremely powerful and never underestimate that. Um, those are the seven things I want to offer you. There are a lot more. I mean, the things that we can talk about over time that Hector and I will uh, obviously be in dialogue about. Um, I do want to just say how uh, grateful I am for your presence in the lives of your diocese. Um, I think of the words of Teresa of Avila. I hope your ministry um, is marked by joy, and I hope you're not immobilized right now by this craziness that we're in. Um, it's it's uh, obviously a very, a very serious setback, so I challenge you to be as creative as you possibly can uh, to keep the conduits open to your kids, whether it is by Zoom or however you have to do things. Um, but don't go into the sleeping giant mode. Uh, uh, St. Teresa of Avila said also, uh, be joyful in spirit. She said, God spare me from sour faced saints. And that's what we need to be. We need to be uh, joyful witnesses to the gospel of Jesus and be invitatory, but keep those conduits open in the midst of this crisis. Uh, the kids are counting on you and uh, so are your bishops. So Stephen, with